Well, this morning, uh, I want to talk to you about when sin brings you low. Um, If you've been paying paying attention to the news this month, it's been it's been rough. Uh, From North Korea to Charlottesburg to to Barcelona, uh, there's a lot happening. So what I want to do is I want to spend some time in a very powerful passage of Scripture. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Micah chapter seven. Micah chapter seven is where we're going to be. And we're going to talk again about when sin brings you low. Now, there's a couple different ways that can happen. Uh, And so we're going to look at those two different ways. And then obviously we're going to look to the answer and the proper response. So let's go ahead and uh, open up in prayer uh, before we get started. Lord, we just come to you now and uh, we thank you for this time to to open up your word and to, to learn from it, Lord. I pray that uh, you'll be with me as I speak and you'll be with them as they hear, Lord. Because as always, if you're not involved, uh, nothing fruitful will happen with this. It'll just be another man speaking, Lord, and we pray that it is so much more than that. And we pray, as as we just sang, that uh, you'll be filled with joy with what you hear this morning, Lord, and that you will move in our hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and let's start by reading uh, the passage out of Micah. Micah chapter 7, starting in verse 1, says this, Woe is me, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned. There is no cluster to eat, no first ripe figs that my soul desires. The godly has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among mankind. They all lie in wait for blood, and each hunts the other with a net. Their hands are on what is evil, to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desires of his soul. Thus, they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, and the most upright of them like a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman, of your punishment, has come. Now their confusion is at hand. Put no trust in a neighbor. Have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my cause and executes justice for me. He will bring me out to the light I shall look upon his vindication. Then my enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will look upon her. Now she will be trampled down like the mire of the streets. This is a powerful passage, but to give you a little bit of background about Micah, Micah lived about 700 B.C., and he, he lived about 22 miles outside of Jerusalem. So at this point, the, the kingdom is divided. You have Israel in the north, and you have Judah in the south. Uh, so Samaria would have been the capital up north, and Jerusalem would have been the capital in the south. And he lived just 22 miles outside of Jerusalem as part of the southern kingdom. Now, towards the end of his life, uh, some, uh, Samaria gets invaded by Assyria as a a judgment or a punishment from God. So the northern kingdom uh, gets taken by Assyria, and then that that passes. And then about a hundred years, not quite a hundred years after Micah dies, Babylon comes in and takes both the northern and the southern kingdoms captive. And they're going to be in captivity for 70 years. And this is God's indignation, God's punishment on them for becoming a wicked people. So there are several themes that run through Micah. Here are a couple of them. 
First, God's wrath is coming for the wicked. Be aware of that. Faithfulness to God means so much more than just fulfilling your rituals. It it means um, justice, mercy, walking humbly with your God, which is one of the most famous verses out of Micah. We will not be covering that this morning, but but that is couched in the idea you can't just go to church. You can't just go through the rituals. That's not godliness. There's more to it than that. It also, one of the other themes is that God's grace flows from his steadfast love, his commitment to his people, not the people's goodness. He's going to to provide for his people and take care of his people, not because they're good, but because he's faithful. And so that's a very important theme that goes through there. As we're looking at these judgments that are going to come, both the Syrian and the Babylonian captivity, one of the prophecies that comes out of this is that there is going to be a shepherd king, a new David, who will deliver the remnant, the true believers amongst the wicked out of the people of God. And the acts that he does in in delivering the people from God's wrath are prophecies and pictures also of Jesus' salvation for the church. And so that, that's kind of the background. And so as we moved into to chapter 7, all of this has been going on. And so we see two sections in what we'll be looking at today. First, Micah is going to lament the sins of the fallen world, and in Israel in general, uh, or specifically. And then we're going to look at Micah's example when it comes to burying our own sinfulness because that's really the two ways sin can bring us low we see it around us and we see it in us and so that's what we're going to look at so let's start by looking at Micah's lament for the sin of Israel and the people around him verse 1 says this woe is me so this this is a a lament he he is brought low he is broken that's what this word uh, woe means. He is, he is sorry for the state of the people around them. But even when you love the people around you and you're broken by their sinfulness, you're indicting them. You're saying at that moment, you are not living godly lives. You are in sin and you are acting wickedly. And that's what he's doing here. He's, he's broken, but it's also an indictment. Now, he goes into this little uh, analogy here about gathering fruit. Now, if you just look at verse 1, you can't understand that. So let's look at verse 2 because he explains what he means, and then we'll go back to verse 1. In verse 2, he explains why he's saying, woe is me. He says, the godly has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among mankind. They all lie in wait for blood, and each hunts the other with a net. So this is why he's broken. Because the godly are gone. Now, this is most likely during the reign of King Ahaz, who was a wicked king. So the leadership is uh, wicked, the people are wicked, and there's all these things going on. And he said, look, godliness is hard to find. And because of that, man is cruel. They hunt each other to get ahead. And we see that even in our culture today. So much of that taking place. And so he is undone, he is falling apart, the sin has brought him low. So now we can understand why he's broken, what he means by this analogy he did in verse 1. Let's look at it again. He says, For I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned. There is no cluster to eat, no first ripe figs that my soul desires. So the picture is this. He, He is going out to look for fruit, to find harvest. But it's all gone, as if it's already all been harvested. The godly are not there. Sure, he he may find a grape here and a grape there, but he can find no cluster. And we all know grapes grow best in clusters. And he's not finding the nourishment for his soul when he looks out into the world. Now, I don't know about you, but I I experience this sometimes just in a, a minor form when I just sit there and I go what am I going to let's watch something on TV let's go through Netflix all right let's check Amazon and and you go through and you just look and you look and you can find you can find things that make you laugh 
things that might get you excited with a little action, but so often you can find nothing that will nourish your soul. And that's just a small microcosm of what he's seeing as he looks out in the world. And so again, he is spiritually parched and he is bemoaning living in such a depraved time. There is much that we can be uh, moaning about too, uh, be moaning our culture as well. Look at verse 3. He goes on because now he's going to explain what's happening, why, what this has led to. He says, their hands are on what is evil to do, to do it well. The prince and the judge, they ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desires of his soul, and they weave it together. So what he's saying is here is, that, look, their hands, and the idea in Hebrew is both of their hands are on to do what is evil. They're not just doing evil with one hand and good with the other. Both hands are engaged in doing evil. And it says, to do it well. Now this idea to do it well in Hebrew, it, it, it's a little bit difficult to, tra- to interpret. It, it most likely just means they're good at it. They do evil, and they are very good at it. But it also carries with this idea to do it well means to do it in, under the idea of, but I'm doing right. When I do my wickedness, I'm doing good. And so they call it evil good and good evil. And, and so this, that was most likely going on. So what was, what was one of the main corruptions that he saw that he hated? He said, The civic rulers are corrupt. Look, the princes and the judges, they ask for bribes. This isn't justice. This isn't righteousness. This is getting ahead. And because of this, it says, the great men. Now, what does it mean by great men? It means the rich men. Uh, He's been talking about this for, if you look look back to Micah chapter 6, Verse uh, 12, you'll see he talks about them here. He said, look, ultimately the great men or the rich men, they're so evil, they can do whatever they want. Why can they do whatever they want? Because they can afford to bribe, to pay the bribes. They can get off. And so because they have no fear of justice, they boast in their wickedness. Yeah, I, I oppressed those people. I, I manipulated the system and took their property. And this was all the type of thing that was going on. And it was a very wicked time. And so all three, the prince, the judge, the rich man, they weave it together, it says. It's woven together. In a sense, they're just working together. It's a cord of three bonds, which is not easily broken. Three strands is really kind of the picture here. Look what it says in verse 4. It says, The best of them is like a briar, the most upright of them a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman, of your punishment, has come. Now their confusion is at hand. So Micah now returns back to the analogy he started in in verse 1 about the the field and looking for fruit. And so he's, he's out looking for spiritual nourishment and doesn't find the fruit. Instead, what he finds is thorns. He looks for nourishment and finds spiritual pain. And when you're walking through a thorn bush, things happen. You get scratches. You get torn clothes. Your eyes and your vision is put in danger. And that's what's happening here. And notice what he says. He says, the best of them are like this. These are the ones that have some semblance of God. The best of them are thorns. If the best of them are like this, what are some of the worst of them? Well, I think we saw some of them probably marching in Charlottesville recently. I mean, this is the kind of thing that's going on. Now, some people, uh, he goes on now, and he, he's going to ask the question, or he's going to now talk to the prophets. He says, he talks to the watchmen. The prophets of this time, the wicked prophets who were not prophesying for God, would, just like in Jeremiah's day, say, uh, Micah's prophesying, look, wrath is coming. They say, wrath is not coming. Don't listen to that. And they cry, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And so this is, this is what's going on. And, and Micah's saying, look, the time of your punishment is coming. This is happening all across this nation. 
saw one lady on the view speaking for Jesus, but uttering wickedness. She's a false prophet. In churches all across the United States today, there are people saying, all roads lead to God. You can do whatever you want. Your sinfulness is actually God-given, and you should embrace it and chase it and live it. There's no judgment coming. They are lying, and their punishment is is going to come because they are misleading the people and soon their lies will be exposed and they will be in utter confusion. Now I like John Calvin's comment on this. He actually asked the question, why would God allow false prophets to spread these false messages? And his answer is because the majority of the world desires to be deceived. They deserve each other. They have itching ears, and so they go hunting for these teachers. And they will reap their reward. He goes on in verse 5 and 6. We'll read these together. To show just how far the corruption has come. Put no trust in a neighbor. Have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with contempt, and the daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies are the men of his own house. So again, these two verses lay out how destructive the sinfulness is, that even the closest relationships have been severed. Many are asking, when is dad going to die? Because I want his inheritance. Husbands are pursuing the lives of their wives and vice versa. Guests are not safe in their homes from their hosts. Corruption has taken over. Brother is against brother. This reminds me of the the time during the Civil War when households were divided. See, this is the problem with sin. It destroys trust. And so often, we cannot trust those who we should be able to because sin has found its way in. And this we see even in our culture. Uh, sometimes, let's put it this way. I, I sometimes go on f- Facebook thinking I'm going to get something at it, but let's put it this way. What it costs me is usually more than it gives me. I start going through it and I'm like, why am I wasting my time in this? But sometimes I'll see things like social experiments. And they'll have, you know, an older lady, a nice lady carrying a purse, and she goes out and she's going to sit down next to someone on a, a public park bench and have a, a conversation with them and just have a nice time and then deliberately she will get up and leave her purse there and walk away just to see what happens and they're videoing all this of course what do these people do ma'am ma'am you've left your purse no most of these people at least the ones they show me on the video i don't know what the true ratio is but they pick it up they run away they start digging through it trying to find something of value this is just a lack of trust even in our own culture and These narratives are just being constantly thrown at us through the media, trying to make it sound worse than it is, which is degrading even our trust in the people we should be able to trust. And so sin is just destroying it. And I think Titus 3 uses some good language to explain what's happening here. They are slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing the day in malice, envy, and hatred. And so Micah's world was fallen. These were the people of God even at this time. Uh, And he was undone with it because he saw the wrath that was going to come. Now here's the problem. When you live in that and you see it all the time, the sinfulness of this world has a way of grabbing your attention and pulling it away from the Lord. And we can begin to focus on on the sinfulness around us and begin to despair. And the problem is, the more we look at the sinfulness around us, the more we start to let it in. I mean, and we sometimes even begin to indulge in it. I mean, a good question we might ask is, what have we set before our eyes these last few weeks that we shouldn't have? What have we been streaming into our homes that we shouldn't be? And and it's just easy. It just starts to creep in. We must be aware of what's going on if we're going to stay pure. 
And I'll say this, I think so many people are distracted, and again, I say this all the time, I believe it's because they don't even know what it is they're distracted from. We are on this planet for a purpose, to glorify God and testify to his glorious grace and finish the race. But so many of us, we're just dying the same slow death as the world because we've forgotten that's why we're here. And so we keep searching for nourishment in the things of the world and we find, up, find ourselves cut and prodded by the thorns. It's easy to be pulled into the world's ways. So, so what's Micah's answer? Well, we see the answer as we start to look at verse 10. He said, but as for me, this is verse seven, by the way, sorry. Uh, but as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. So, I will look to the Lord. It's pulling me away. I will look to the Lord. That's the answer. That's a proper response. Setting my mind on things above. Being heavenly minded. Whatever is pure, lovely, noble. I will think on those things. This is the only way we can be preserved in a fallen world. This is the only way we ourselves as Christians will not become thorns to other Christians instead of the clusters of grapes that we should be. You see, even the godly can hardly keep, our, we can hardly keep ourselves pure when wickedness is everywhere. We are engaged in a spiritual battle and many of us, and I say this from experience because I'm there so often myself, are asleep to that reality. We're not even awake to it. We must look to God because we are in a war with sin and the stakes are eternal. We must be renewing our minds and not being conformed to the pattern of this world. We must be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So we, we need, first of all, we need to not be so overly uh, occupied with the evil of, that surrounds us. And for some of us, that actually may mean we need to stop watching the news so much. Because I don't know, I, I flip through the news stories on my phone and I'm like, these read like uh, clickbait bloggers just trying to send me a narrative to get me to read their thing and it's sending false messages so often. And so we just, we need to, we need to not be over, overly occupied. So Micah says, look, I will wait for the God of my help. He, he's, he's found no cluster, no nourishment, so he's still parched, but he's going to look to God with patience. That's what the word wait means. He knows that when I first look to God, I may not get what I'm looking for right away. I must be patient and wait for him. But it will not be in vain. Waiting will not be in vain because we know that those who wait on the Lord will what? Renew their strength. And this is what he is holding out. But it takes waiting sometimes. Some people say, yeah, I'm feeling that. You know what, I am going to take, take some time and start reading the Bible this week. And so they read it for three or four days and they go, well, nothing really happened. I don't know what that preacher was talking about. You must wait. You must linger with the word of God and in prayer. Your strength will be renewed. He will hear you. But now, Micah is going to take an interesting turn. See, he's been talking about the sin outside and the sin of others, but now he's going to start speaking about indwelling sin, his own sin. See, here's the problem. You, you can't turn your eyes away from a wicked world, put them on a holy God without seeing your own sinfulness and your own fallenness. This is why many who will initially like, yeah, I need to look to the Lord, whoop, no, I don't think I want to keep looking there. Because it, we, like Isaiah will say, woe is me for I am undone because I live in a land of unclean lips and I myself have unclean lips. That's the way it works. When we see the sinfulness of man and the wrath it deserves, we will understand our own sinfulness and the wrath it deserves. And so he goes on in verse eight and he makes this statement. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall... I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. So the question here is, 
is Micah speaking of himself or is he speaking as Israel during the punishment that was going to come? Because remember, when the captivity came, there were wicked people in Israel and also the godly in Israel who had to go through that captivity. Well, the answer truly is that he is speaking as a representative of Israel. This is one of the difficult things about reading Micah is he jumps in time without any warning. He'll be talking about the present. I'm talking about how wicked things are. Woe is me for I am undone. But now he's, he's in, in the future when they're under captivity and bearing the indignation of the Lord. But I don't believe that's all it is. I, I mean, that is what he's doing. But I believe he's also speaking of his own sinfulness. He can speak as a representative of God's people because he is one of them. He knows this experience personally notice he he says when i fall not if i fall he knows his own struggle with sin he knows that sometimes he has sat in the darkness of his own sinfulness there had been times that satan called his name and he answered just like every one of us here but he know and he also knows when he falls the enemy will boast But he's saying, rejoice not over me. Notice what it goes on in verse 9. We'll look at some other things later, but let's look at verse 9. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. Here is a biblical truth that Micah understands. Every single believer will bear the indignation of the Lord from time to time. Hebrews is so bold to tell us, if you're a believer and you've never experienced the chastisement of God, you're not a believer. It's that clear in Scripture. Every Christian will experience this from time to time, the heavy conviction of sin. And and again, if if you're a Christian, you are in this very moment in a personal battle with your own sinfulness. And there are certain things that beset you regularly. I don't even need to give examples of them, but it's probably when I said that, a certain sin popped into your mind that you know you struggle with. We have both within us flesh and spirit, and the two are contrary to one another. This fight is not easy, nor do we have it completely under control. That's part of being a believer. A little over a year ago, it was probably about a year and a half ago, I was up late late one night, and I was doing some journaling, and I was just, I was lamenting my own sinfulness. I was sitting there thinking, you know, how many times, um, you know, am I on fire one day, but the next day I'm cold as ice. How many times am I lazy? Do I have the wrong attitude? Am I focused on the things of the world? Am I being unloving, Uh, living for the pleasures of the world instead of the things of God, and probably a whole host of other things I don't even want to tell you about. But I was just lamenting my sinfulness. And so what I did at that moment is I wrote down five things at that moment that I hated to admit to to other people about my battle with sinfulness. Now, I assume, because they were true of my experience, that some of these are probably true for you as well. You can tell me later if I'm wrong. But I'm going to give you what I wrote down. Here are five things that I believe are probably true about your battle of sin that you hate to admit. Number one, some of the battle scars with sin are fresher than your comfortable acknowledging. They are more fresh than you're comfortable acknowledging. See, as as Christians, we're quick to admit, yes, I've struggled with sin, but what we like to talk about are the ones from the past, the ones we've overcome, the ones that you've, you've found victory in. The problem is there are these recent ongoing battles as well. And the fact that some of these are fresh are not things we like to broadcast to the world. The second thing that I believe is true about your battle with sin that you hate to admit, at least it is for me, is that you sometimes like to get as close to the flame of sin as possible without getting burned. No matter how much you despise that sin that so easily besets you, you still find yourself wanting to get as close to it as possible. And you think, I'll only let my go, myself go this far, and that's where I'll draw the line. The problem is, Once we get to that point, the line just seems to move a little bit. 
And this proclivity to push boundaries has left you on more than one occasion beating yourself up because you've gone too far. Number three, you often wonder why you despise that very thing that you hate. I'm sorry, you wonder why you're drawn to the very thing you hate. Every time you find yourself deceived by the deceitfulness of sin, you wonder, why do I go after that? Why do I love it? And like Paul, you cry out, who will save me from this body of death? Even when I'm trying to do good, evil is close at hand. And deep down, you know that the problem with temptation is you. The problem with temptation is me. Those things wouldn't be a temptation if I didn't desire them. And deep down, we know that we still have desires that war against our soul. That's Peter. Peter tells us that. Number four, when it comes to your growth in godliness, you thought you would have been a further along than you are now. I can look back when I was in college, and I'd look to the time, and go, man, when I'm, when I'm 40, when I'm 43 in there, I'll have read the Bible so many times. I'll have spent so much time in prayer. Man, I'm going to see so many great victories. Now that I'm here, I look back and I go, I didn't read the Bible like I planned it. I didn't spend as much time in prayer as I thought. I'm still struggling with some of these sinfulness, things with sinfulness. So there's this aspect where you really did thought, think you'd be further along than you are now. Number five, uh, the last one is this. This is the one that gets me, I think, the most sometimes, is you wonder if you're the only one. I mean, certainly there are other Christians out there who have risen above this, right? I mean, you may be sitting here this morning looking at the person next to you or the person in front of you, behind you, and think, I mean, they're the picture of piety. They, they can't struggle with this. And on the outside, that's the way it may look, but that's not the way it really is. And sometimes, these are the people I also tend to run into on the internet, uh, contrary to scripture, they'll tell me, well, you know, I've actually stopped sinning. (laughs) And you are right to laugh at that. But that is a a whole movement of theology out there. People think they can rise above it completely. And so, whenever I bring these up, whether it's online or anywhere, I tend to get some pushback. And they'll say things like, well, you know, that sounds like someone before they became a Christian. Uh, but, you know, once we're Christians, we're, we're new creations in Christ. My response to them is actually to push it further and say, I actually believe the closer you walk with the Lord, the more you will experience these five things. The farther you are away, the less you will experience them because you have a tender conscience sensitive to the things of God. Uh, Now, it is true. We do need to keep this in mind. It is true that when the Holy Spirit moves into our lives, so often he keeps Christians from those notorious sins. He he protects us. He keeps us away. But the more we grow in the Lord, the more even those respectable sins that we know all Christians struggle with begin to, to bring you low. But even with all of that in mind, remember, there are Davids who commit adultery. There are men like Peter who walked with him closely for years and deny him in a tough moment. And there are Jonah's, people who speak his words, who flee when told to go somewhere. And there may be people here this morning doing that very thing. I like that one pastor uh, put it so bluntly. He said, look, if, if I have such battles with sin, am a Christian, and you claim to be a Christian and have no battles with sin and you can't understand anything I'm talking about, is, he says, those experiences are so different that the probability is that one of us is not a Christian. Either I'm not because I'm still dealing with the sin and I should be over them, or you're just callous to your own sinfulness. And the Spirit is not moving to counter the flesh. But as we went through these passages, did you see the hope in them? 
Did you see there? Look at verse 8 again. Rejoice not over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. Even in our own sinfulness, when we fall, we shall rise. And we can declare that by the word of God. John Piper calls this gutsy guilt. Being broken over our sinfulness, but confident in the Christ who can save us. Saying, I will rise, not because I deserve to rise, but because he will raise me. See, the enemy has no reason to boast, because even when we are brought low, we, we have hope. There can never be a time when a believer is lamenting over his sinfulness that he is without hope. Because that's the believer Christ says will rise. So even when we sit in the darkness of our own sin, it says he will be a light to us. Even in those moments, he will not abandon us. Verse 9 goes on and says, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. He will bring me out to the light. I shall look upon his vindication. If, if we are convicted of our sinfulness, and even if you're sitting here this morning and you're feeling the conviction of your sinfulness, that is because the Holy Spirit is at work in you. And that is a gift, even if it is painful. Because it is far worse to be sitting in our sinfulness and not feel it. And not feel that conviction. You see, without the conviction of sin, if God's discipline came to us, what would we do? Murmur and complain and shake our fist at him. But when it comes with the conviction of sin and the Lord moves us to a point of contrition, what can we do? We can do what Micah says. I will bear his indignation because I've sinned against him. Now again, let's remember, not every hardship we go through is a direct cause of sin. That's clearly biblical. But there are times when we are feeling the indignation of sin. And that contriction, contriction brings us low. And we saw in the last verse that when we sit in our darkness, he'll be a light to us even there. So we already have some light when we're in the conviction of sin. But he says, I will bring you out to the light. There will be times he's going to bring you out. And there will be times he'll bring you out in this life. And ultimately he will bring you out when he brings you home and you face glorification and are transformed into his likeness with him in heaven. And so we will look upon his vindication. The world is saying, you say God is with you. You're struggling with the same things that you say. I, I, when I do them, they're evil. And, and you're no better. He says, don't worry. God will be there. You will, you will look upon his vindication. Now realize, this is only for people in Christ. This is only for people who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. The judgment is still coming for those who refuse to do that. Look at verse 10. Then my enemy will see. They're out there boasting, telling me Christianity is wicked. Christianity uh, leads to bigotry. Christianity leads to all sorts of things. They're, they will see, and shame will cover who, her head who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will look upon her, and she will be trampled down like the mire in the streets. Judgment is coming for those who do not know. But let's keep this very clear. For those of us who do believe, the only reason we can lift our head in confidence and say, I've fallen, but I will rise, is because of Jesus, the shepherd king, the one prophesied to be born in Bethlehem in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. That is the only reason. So when the, when the sins of the fallen world wear you down, Turn your eyes to Jesus. Find nourishment from him. And if possible, find nourishment by becoming part of a healthy cluster of grapes. I mean, that's what we are here at Bethel Grace. We are people who struggle with sinfulness, but we are looking to grow healthy in the Lord. Now, when your own sinfulness brings you low, I want you to remember these three things in closing. You lament your own sinfulness. You have all these things. Remember this. First of all, you are not alone in your battle with sin. Battling with sin is part of the Christian life. And biblically, sanctification, we are told, is never complete in this life. 
If that is true, that means every one of us here have a certain level of sanctification that is taking place in our life. But none of us have perfection in that. So that means every single one of us sitting here still have sins that need to be sanctified. It is part of the Christian life. And the closer you walk with the Lord, the more you will feel that battle. But remember, these inward battles, being more awake to them, is part of what God is using to sanctify you. It's, it's interesting. It's like, if you walk close to the Lord, you're going to feel some pain, in a sense, with the conviction of sin. And the cure for that pain is to run into more of that pain. It's an odd paradox, but it's true. Number two, the second thing I want you to remember is you're not alone, not only because everybody else who's a Christian is battling with this, but you're not alone because Jesus is with you. You see, Christ did not go to the cross to atone for your sins and bring you forgiveness to then leave you alone to see if you could hack it. That is not what he does. He called you, and he will keep you. Even when he's sending his rod of correction upon you, it is his love that is dealing with you, not his wrath. His wrath was satisfied on the cross. And he said, I am faithful and just to complete the work I've started in you. Yes, it is true. You can look back over your life and see victories over certain sins. Look forward, you will see more of them. But you must keep walking close to the Lord. So stay close to your Savior. Uh, Hide his word in your heart. Pray without ceasing. He has promised to be with you even to the end of the age. And the third one, I leave you with this. The enemy is going to continue to rejoice over you. The enemy is going to continue to accuse. And when the enemy comes to you and accuses you, remember, there is no condemnation in Christ. The, the enemy comes, and this is what he's frequently going to tell you. You're not worthy to be a Christian. You fell again. You keep falling. You are not worthy to be a Christian. When that happens, never take the bait. Because what he wants to do in that moment, wants you to do in that moment, is to combat that statement by saying, well, I know I'm not great, but I do go to church every Sunday. I, I pray, I read my Bible. The minute you start doing that, you have played right into his hand. What you need to do in that moment is acknowledge that he just told you the truth. I am not worthy to be a Christian. I've never been worthy to be a Christian. I'm not worthy now, and I never will be worthy to be a Christian. See, that's a tactic of Satan. Sometimes he tells you the truth in a way to try to get you to combat the truth. And we must be aware of that. So never take that bait. I am not worthy to be a Christian, but Jesus is worthy, and I am counted righteous in him. Now, the second one, he'll come to you and say, well, yes, I, I do realize that no one's worthy to be a Christian, but that sin, or that many times, you've gone too far. He, he, you know, he, he's not going to save you. But I, and I've said this a few times in teaching Sunday school around here, but I think it's worth repeating. Whenever that lie comes to you, says you've fallen too far, I want you to do this. Picture Jesus Christ on the cross in faith, and imagine yourself walking up to him and saying, Jesus, you didn't do enough to save me. Your sacrifice was not sufficient. My sins were too much. And the minute you picture yourself doing that, I think you'll see the folly of walking up to God and telling him that something he did was not good enough. Don't take the bait. So, take heart. Look to God, even in this fallen world, Draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. You may have to wait patiently, but you will renew your strength. And when you fall, you will, re- you will rise. When you sit in darkness, he will be a light to you. And it's his conviction that makes it possible for you to grow and to bear his indignation at times. But never forget, he will plead your cause, and you will see his vindication, and you will stand with him in righteousness one day. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this amazing passage of Scripture. We thank you for everything it teaches us, Lord. 
And we know even in our own battles with sinfulness, we will go home and forget half of this. And so often it's easy for us to just keep going throughout the week as if we didn't hear your word, Lord. We just pray that you help us keep it steadfast in our hearts. Help us to grow from the nourishment that we felt this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.